This is the Salt Lake City Python Meetup Group. I am Ferris. I started this meetup group back in January of 2013. Can you believe that? Four years. We're hitting our four year anniversary on February. And I'll talk more about how awesome uh, that is. Who changed the date? It's not 2010. <laughs> Last, last time we just kept getting somebody who couldn't hear the stream, so they decided to keep getting in our etherpad to tell us they couldn't hear the stream. So, that was fun. Uh, this is Salt Lake City Python. We started here in Sugar House uh, 2013. I was sitting in a cafe, and I was like, hey, that person's using Django. Hey, why isn't there a Python user group? Hey, there is, but you have to drive south at 6 o'clock on I-15 in order to do that. Who likes doing that? Nobody. So we started one downtown. Um, and we were in Sugar House, now we're at the U. I like this venue a lot. Thanks again. Um, well, again, slash, in general. Um, there are a lot of little groups, though. Uh, we have Python Utah, it's like this whole thing where we give each other funding and raffle prizes. So we have Salt Lake City Python. For those of you in Logan, of which there's just one, we have Python Utah North. We have the Salt Lake City Pi Ladies. Pi Ladies Foundation is awesome. They also have uh, a few meetups going on. Um, that's Carrie Joy who runs that. Anybody part of that? No? Um, we also have Python at the Point, which is the South Valley group. Anybody from the South or from that group? Yeah? Awesome. So yeah, that's the Python at the point. That's also the Provo group now, de facto. Uh, we have the Salt Lake City Girl Develop It. Anybody familiar with Girl Develop It? They're another awesome organization. If you want to ever just volunteer there, you can teach a workshop. They can pay you, and then you can keep the money or just donate it back. That's what I did. I taught a fun workshop on Django. But yeah, those are, those are just some of the many, many tech community things going on in the Valley. We have a website that doesn't work, it's slcpy.com. I lost the server. This has been a running joke, but I really do need to fix this somehow, I don't know. Probably just switch it over to JavaScript and not tell anybody, just like I did with utahpython.org, which is all in JavaScript now. That way we pay zero hosting costs. Um, although I am talking to Xmission about getting our stuff hosted, so maybe we'll just do that, because they are also one of our sponsors. Hey, Yo. Talk to me after all. Sweet. Which which uh, service? Uh, oh yeah, I I spoke to his Pete. Um, I already know Pete Ashdown and uh, Matt and Matt isn't here today, which is kind of fun. Is he? No. Okay. And Emily, right? Yeah, I know X Mission peeps. <laughs> but yeah, we'll talk definitely. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, so here's the GitHub repos. If you decide that you want to make a pull request for your local friendly Python meetup, then I will never ask you for a donation for two months at least. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, our sponsors include Pythonistas like you. Again, at the end of this, feel free to make a $5 optional donation. That goes towards the pizza, that goes towards raffle prizes, um, that goes toward stuff like getting our capture card barely set up. Um, and it's a slush fund in the event that we don't have a venue like this, which is free. We could use it to purchase a venue every month, which would work as well. Um, so for example, while we were in between en venues, Impact Hub came up as a venue to use, which would be great. Um, their parking's even worse than here. Uh, and they would have charged, I think it was $200, but I got an in with them and it would have been much less, but still, that's, that's our emergency fund for things like that. Um, not to jinx it, knock on wood. I like this venue a lot. Um, sponsors, X Mission. X Mission, usually I do the spiel for Matt. Um, they, they sponsor our pizza and raffle prizes. They will also be sponsoring a number of raffle prizes at the soiree. So that's gonna be awesome. They've been awesome for the last six, seven months. They've been consistently sponsoring us. Um, whoa, what's this? Who's, who's pasting stuff in here? Who's doing storage? Who's, who's pasted storage? It's storage again. Was that you? Yeah. 
Oh, they, put they it. Asked. Put it in the news stuff. Okay. There's an order, Dylan. You can't okay. just keep changing oh. the order. Hey, look, there's the news stuff. Um, Hello. Where were we? Now I don't know where I am. Come on, man. You're like editing my cue card while I'm trying <laughs> to read it. X Mission. They won't throttle your internet for any reason because they're not Comcast. X Mission. They're not Comcast. <laughs> University of Utah. <laughs> They are a proud sponsor of this venue. This venue is awesome. I really like it when the VGA works. And it looks like it does. It was literally just the cable. So they need to change the cable. Just FYI. It's, it's right here. It's broken right here. I know exactly. um, <clears throat> new sponsors are always appreciated. Feel free to reach out on the meetup group. Um, tech Systems will actually, they used to be our consistent sponsor. They will be coming back to sponsor for the soiree. So it looks like we're going to have some awesome raffle prizes. Um, yeah, new members. Who's new here? Ha ha! And it better be the same people that raised their hands last time, and not fewer, because now you get to introduce yourself. So go ahead, keep that hand up. You're going to give your name, your occupation. Usually we do a non-code thing. This time we'll do a code non-code thing, and it's your New Year goal. So I'll start. My name is Ferris. I'm the chief backend sanitation engineer at the uh, at my company I clean up other people's code um, my new year goal is to learn how to do react native because I've been dabbling with like mobile apps those seem kind of cool that's my code goal my non code goal I should probably make one probably get into yoga I'm gonna pretend I'm into yoga because that's like a thing that you do in January and forget about in February so who else <laughs> go for it I'm Matt Kingsbury I just started working for the Huntsman Cancer Institute I'm a database analyst so I build databases for them with their horribly messy cancer data and um, Python do you ever like look at the database and you're like this schema is cancer like <laughs> every single hour <laughs> yeah <laughs> Literally, no. Uh, yeah, so I guess my whole code goal is uh, I've been doing a lot of backend stuff. I'd really like to get into Django. Sweet. And any non-code goal? Uh, well, I just moved here, so I'll just uh, <laughs> still get my feel for that. So we'll see how that. Uh, my goal is just get adjusted. Get adjusted to the valley. Buy a, a mask. I'm not kidding. Anyway, <laughs> oh, air mask. Uh, it's a joke, but it's not. Um, anybody else? Who else is new? This gentleman with the glasses. Yes. I'm Tyler. Just graduated from the UAU in computer engineering. Yeah. I'm working in Control 4, doing hardware computing. And we use Python every day for everything. Python every day? Do you say that too? <laughs> no. What's your goals? My goals? Yes. Um, 2018, still young. Still time to make goals that you won't reach. Push ups every day, 100 squats. Yes. Yes. The one punch man workout. I like it. I got you. Uh, what about the gentleman behind you? Uh, my name is Dave Kuntz. I recently moved here from Texas. I work at VaporSense, which is one of the startups here at the U. I'm a chemometric scientist, so I use a lot of scikit learn in Python to build models uh, to quantify the sensor information and try to predict if explosives are present or not. My programming goal for this year, so I'm kind of self-taught and just going along, and I want to make code that's actually maintainable. So, so this is my big goal for this year, now that I actually understand it, make sure that I can understand it in six months. And my personal goal, will be to climb a total of 100,000 feet on my bike this year. Nice. Awesome. That's intense. Yeah. <laughs> As a person who's constantly cleaning unmaintainable code, I thank you for your goal. Who else is new? Oh, this gentleman uh, with the I'm awesome hat. I'm John Norton. I'm an engineer for hire. We're bringing blue paving. <laughs>
Google, Google I'm, I'm rather new to Python. I've taught computer science for many years and used a lot of other languages and kind of fallen in love with Python. So here I am. So I want to learn more about Python and this. My non code code goal is uh, to start a aquaponic system. Thanks. Nice. Nice. There's no like microcontrollers or anything, well, just a pure. I said no coding goals. Okay, I'm just kidding. No, that sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. Uh, who else? Um, my name is Rob Oaks. Um, I'm an engineer. Um, I work for a company called Oaks Engineering. Nominally, I'm the CTO. But um, my coding goal this year is to finally open source our company's entire code base. Nice. Um, trying to get that done by the end of the year. And then non-code goal is um, it's stupid to finally spend a little bit of time with my wife and family. Oh, awesome. I'm trying, trying to get off the startup bandwagon a little bit and get more back. That to whole work-life balance thing. Week, yeah. So good luck. <laughs> it's a good goal. Anybody else? Go once, go twice. Okay. Well, welcome new people. This meetup is a little bit different than the others, and the next one will be even more different than all the others, but this one's going to be, instead of a one monolithic talk, we're gonna have a bunch of speakers. Dylan's gonna be in charge of that, because you know that you're getting to be a mature meetup group when you pass the buck, so. <laughs> Dylan, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, let's see, who's hiring? Team is hiring a little bit. Still, they still had a couple of positions, I think, on workable. QA manager, QA manager and yeah. something marketing. Is marketing the, do we have another back end position? We have an architecture, data, database architecture. Database architecture position at yeah. team. Just go to team.workable.com. That's team with two E's. Because why spell things correctly if you're a startup? I work at team, by the way, so I get to make that joke. Um, who else is hiring in the Valley? It is that time of the year where everybody should be like, oh yeah, this is hiring, this is hiring, this is, there's a lot of places hiring, so. Rentworks are hiring. I don't know how to talk to the guy this morning. Wait, what, who is? Rentworks, they're a company out of, I think it's Rentworks. Uh, they're a company, uh, they're owned by Wasatch Property. They're both, um, they're, they work out of Logan. Actually. Oh. You want to move to Logan? They're looking for um, both a junior and I think a senior. Mm -hmm. Sweet. I said enter. There we go. Okay. Anybody else know of anybody else who's hiring? Uh, oh. Newmont College of Computer Science is hiring for an evening course instructor. They're looking for Python instructors and a Ruby instructor. That might be a fun night job. Mm -hmm. Um. Who else? You said plural site. Not really a Python position, if I understand their back end. It's Ruby? Is it ITE? Uh, S -I yeah. Not GH? I don't know. I should know this. I'm from Utah. There we go. Yes. Excuse me. Delmo is hiring a senior technical Sweet. Anybody else hiring? Virtue Strain is always hiring. What is it? Virtue Strain. Vert, Virtue. Virtue Strain. It's part of the Dell world. Dell Computing? Yeah. They're still uh, around? They run NASA S3 competitor and NASA um, AC2 competitor through the Dell world. Good luck. <laughs> I mean, it's good to have competition. It's hey, 1% market share. That's actually a lot. So I, I'm going to give kudos for that. Um, anybody else hiring? No? Any MLMs hiring? I'm just kidding. Do not work for an MLM. I know it's Utah, but we don't go that way. Who's looking for a gig? That guy. <laughs> Louis Shabib. Okay. Just paste it. You always do it. Okay, just paste it. <laughs> that guy's my dad, just FYI, if you're new here, if you can't tell. Anyway, 
Go for it. Data science extraordinaire. I'm going to misspell that. Yep. There we go. <laughs> Anybody else looking? Tim, you're looking? I still don't have a job. <laughs> oh, you think they'll just come to you? You're like, no. I'm Tim Anderson, just to give me a job. No, that, no? Though that would be nice. But I'm just, I'm just, just lazy enough and have just enough savings <laughs> that I just sit on my butt. Lazy data scientist. Well, yeah, it's true. Does that work? Or do you want to put? Sure. No, that's good. Okay, good. X. You, you can just take the extraordinaire and put extraordinary. an extraordinarily lazy. lazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so hard to type without seeing the screen. I'm like mirrored. Oh, did I do it? Yeah. Are you sure you're not a data scientist ninja? Uh, right, correct. An extraordinarily lazy data scientist ninja. Hey, some of the best lazy devs, or some of the best devs are the lazy devs. <laughs> it's true. They just import whatever you need. <laughs> import business plan. <laughs> and done. Done. <laughs> That'll be $200,000. Import website. Yeah. All right. Yep, that's how you do it in Python. Um, import cure for cancer, right? There you go. I'm trying that. Yeah, you should. <laughs> is, is that in depth? It, uh, I think they on? got... It's only two, though. No, I think it's only NPM right now for some reason. Thanks. Uh, sweet. Community news. Is, unless there's anybody else who's looking, now's your chance to shine. Okay. Net neutrality is under attack, as everybody knows that vote went the other way. It was the way that everybody thought it was going to go. The reason I bring up a political issue in this little group of ours is because it's one that directly affects your work. So if you are a web worker or if you have ever pulled a PIP package and want that PIP package to download that one megabyte in less than 20 minutes, then you probably should care about having a slow lane on your home network. If you have fiber, it still doesn't mean that you shouldn't care because it means that anybody who's using your website is now going to be affected by something like this. So, something awesome happened this week. Anybody know what? In this little fight, if you've been keeping up. So, yeah. the Senate actually has this thing where if they have 30 votes, they can say, hey, this committee, we need to like look at what you did and maybe overturn it. So once they have 30 votes, they can take that to the floor. And then once they have a simple majority, they can say, nope, shouldn't have done that. That was a jerk move. So call your senator. Our local senators are definitely not on this side of the issue. But you should call them and tell them why you're on this side of the issue and that you're going to be paying attention because they literally would be taking money out of your pocketbook. Um, yeah, the fight's not over. It's still under attack, and I'm going to probably keep having this spiel until probably for a long time in the U.S., until everybody gets fiber. Alternatives that I thought of and brainstormed for the last four weeks that you could be actively doing as well. Who lives in a non-Salt Lake City city in the valley, right? Who lives in one that is not incorporated with Utopia? Okay, guess what? You should go to a city council meeting and demand that they revisit the utopia issue. Because if you make a municipal internet, um, it is nearly trivial now, thanks to utopia, to set that up instead of waiting for somebody like Google Fiber, which doesn't really care about local stuff, but they kind of do now in Salt Lake City. Why not ask about, hey, let's get utopia. We've had this thing for literally, what is it, 14 years now? Thanks. Why don't, hmm? Yeah, so let's get it in our little city. So, for example, if you're in Cottonwood Heights, like myself, next city council meeting, that's going to be what I'm doing. I'm going to be like, come on, I need this. Let's get some better internet here. I'm sick of Comcast as the only internet. And I'll even make that face and do the thing with the hands. And it probably won't work, but at least the issue opens up. Your local government is what's going to matter for this. Enough said about that. Oh, look. 
Like Utopia has 10 gigabytes, my gigabits, and my dad wants to uh, <coughs> brag about that. That little old Brigham City now has 10 gigabit connection to his house for less than what I'm paying for my measly, what is it, 50 that we barely get ever. And then when it's like snowing outside, it's super slow. Yeah, that's what happens when you have a cable internet. Oh, fish hackathon. You want to give a quick spiel about this? So um, I, uh, I, I'm helping the University of Utah to co-organize um, an event called Fish Hackathon. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with hackathons, but they're basically you organize a team, you show up, you meet new people, you get presented with some problem, and then 28 hours later, you sleep deprived, get told what is awesome about your idea and what's not, and then it gets ranked, and if you win, you go to an international competition, and hopefully you win a lot of money. Do you get any fish? Uh, we're working on that. Will fish be served for lunch? Fish will be on the menu. <clears throat> we're, still, we're still working on that. If anyone knows any really good fish providers, I'd love to talk to them. Nice. Um, so my, my pitch to you guys is hopefully, please come. Uh, there is a nominal fee, but if the fee is a big issue, um, talk to me afterwards. I'll give you a card, and we will waive it. Um, it's like five bucks. The reason we do that is because a lot of, if you don't, a lot of people sign up and no one shows up. But... Um, more, more, more to you guys, what we really need is um, we're really trying to sell this hard to the students. And we want the students to come and we want them to have a good experience. And to do that, you need to have people who kind of know what they're doing. So if there's any experience... So why are you asking us then? <laughs> it, it, it glows. Um, so I, I'm looking for people who might be interested in mentoring. It's a three-hour commitment. You come, you talk to a bunch of students, you encourage their dreams, and then you go home and you sleep. And then you come back the next day and you see what they did. Um, and hopefully it's awesome. Um, if, if, you, any of your com if you work for a company that might be interested in sponsoring, I'd love to talk to you. But it's going to be awesome. Um, it, there's there's going to be a lot of really cool people there. And um, the, uh, the purpose behind this hackathon is um, sustainability technologies. So um, the reason it's called Fish Hackathon is we're trying to help prevent overfishing of waterways, but all, all, also waterway management. Uh, we're working with the Department of Natural Resources to maybe do something about all the toxic algae blooms in um, Utah Lake, for example. Uh, um, you can come up with a solution with that. A lot of people pay a lot of money for it. Anyway, um, if, if you're interested, it's the eighth, or I'm sorry, the ninth and tenth of February. Um, starts at six o'clock on the ninth and runs through six o'clock on the tenth. Where will it be? It's at Impact Hub. Oh, okay. That's downtown Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. People who don't know. And if you if you have any questions, I'd love to talk to you. Sweet. Um, we also have. Oh. Uh, we're Utah. We're special. Oh, I see. <laughs> and so it does, it does. We are the only community that is not running on the tenth of the month. It is the ninth and tenth. So people will copy our answers. And I hope so. <laughs> um, we have other community news. If you don't know already. This happened last month, but it's worth noting Django 2.0 has made its full release. Huzzah! No more Python, Python 2.7. Python. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Salt Lake City DevOps Days, May 15th through 16th. I think, are they still doing a call for proposals? Yes, we are. We've got four more days until it closes. you got four days to do a call mm -hmm. for and proposals. And Lindley's finished the shopping cart and we'll be rolling it out later this week. Oh, yeah. You work with Lindley, right? Yeah, Lindley and Trent. But Trent moved from you guys. I know. Well, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> oh, that's why Lindley hasn't gotten my stuff done. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Me either, Ferris. I know. Me either. Um, I could. I have to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> Open West 2018. They had their call for proposals. They're due January 31st, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. And yeah, who's been to Open West? It's a lot of fun, but we never get Python representation, so. Get on that. Come on. We could get some Python going with OpenWest. If you don't know, OpenWest is the largest, I think, Utah tech convention. Happens every year. Celebration of all things open source. Everything from Python to even PHP, um, JavaScript. Um, lots of stuff about product management, project management, things like that. It's a really rich set of uh, talks. Uh, and it's right here in Utah. And what else? Storage.io. Who, who, who owns a cryptocurrency other than Bitcoin? Anybody? Yeah. 
nerds. Now, <laughs> storage is a pretty interesting cryptocurrency. Who knows what it is? Anybody? Yeah? So you basically rent out hard disk space, and they pay you in storage coin for the availability of your hard disk space. They're a local startup. Who's seen Silicon Valley? So that idea that they had in the latest season, the closest real life parallel is probably storage. It's kind of interesting. But basically, they're having a meetup about distributed systems. Um, has anybody tried programming a distributed systems app? That's actually, that's actually my code goal, the more I think about it, is I want to make an Ether, uh, Ethereum DAP, which is a distributed application, basically. Decentralized. Hmm? Decentralized. Decentralized, yes. That's what I meant. Um, yeah. Probably something like CryptoKitties, if not something else. Maybe Crypto Pokemon. Haha. -ha. <laughs> but yeah, so really interesting stuff going on there. They are also at Impact Hub, actually, January 17th. Um, and yeah, they asked us to give a quick pitch, and I know a couple people there, so I said, sure. Um, yes, and the most important upcoming community event to put in your calendar, if you have not done so already, is our annual soiree. February 7th, we will be meeting again at Mellow Mushroom because it is family friendly and it serves beer, and there's not many places in Utah that does that. Um, they are great. <laughs> uh, that, that event consists of cake and raspberry pies, and only one of those is an actual dessert. So there's gonna be a lot of giveaways. Um, that's also our fundraising event. The money that you pitch in for this, this one is, you know, you have to pay for it, but all that money does get used throughout the year to buy things, to put into the slush fund, to do all that fun stuff. Um, parking will be downstairs. There's more n details at the meetup. A couple things to note is that you do need to sign up on uh, Eventbrite if you can, um, or at least RSVP on the meetup. If you show up and you don't have an Eventbrite pass, that's fine, I'll just charge you at the door. Um, and then if you want beer, that is a higher tier ticket, that way people who are not drinking are not subsidizing the people who are, because you know that's only fair in my humble opinion. Um, but I will be definitely devouring um, pizza and beer along with everybody and celebrating our fourth year. Isn't that crazy? You can't clap yet. Not yet. Because we haven't hit it yet. For all I know, like a giant meteor could like, boom. <laughs> and then all this planning's for nothing. But yes, soon, February 7th. If we make it to that, then you can clap. Um, Python. Uh, new topics. So that means we won't be having the same kind of talk where we have a talk. Um, so March, anybody want to do a talk in March? Anybody keen on doing a talk in March? <laughs> If you wanted to do a call for paper, or call, uh, if you wanted to do a proposal at OpenWest, now is your chance to practice it on us first. I know somebody's doing that here tonight. Yeah, you're practicing. You're doing OpenWest talk? Or, yes, so we will be your guinea pig um, tonight. But for a longer talk, that's definitely the best time to do that. We have all these suggestions of things that people want to do. They just keep getting longer and longer and longer. Bitcoin transactions in Python. I wonder who put that there. Um, OpenCV. Yeah. You could just grab one of these topics, learn about it, and give a talk. Or if you're an expert in something, give a talk. Or if it's barely Python related, but it's fascinating. Like we had one about um, DNA. That was awesome. It was not barely Python. There was a lot of Python, but it was just a really interesting talk on how to use Python for such a complicated problem. And fractals. Mm -hmm. Out of curiosity, um, anyone interested in WebSockets in Python? WebSockets in Python. I will put it on the list. I was going to say, I have a talk on it. If you're looking for a speaker, I'd be happy to do that. Sweet. Yeah. Can I just put that on there? Yes. <laughs> you volunteered. Then. Yeah, you just volunteered, by the way. <laughs> just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Uh, grab me after, and I'll get more details. Sweet. Um, while we're waiting for a transition, i got to ask a couple things. First, if you are giving a talk tonight or would like to, please move to the front row so it's easier to transition between things. Um, second, take a five-minute break, and we'll be right back after these messages. I'm going to grab some water. 
so Dylan, mm -hmm. how this is going to work, this is your cord of truth. That's the cord of truth. This will take it, put it on the projector, and put it streaming onto the site. So I pull this out and... Yeah, pull this or this, depending on if they have an HDMI. If they don't have an HDMI, just do the thing. We. He's good to go. You tested yours, right? No, you te he tested But yes, you're good to go if you have HDMI. I don't think anybody has USB-C, but if they do, let, have them let me know right away because I do have a connector for that. Okay, and then look at um, 12 minutes. Do you want me to be a moderator person? Uh, yeah. I think we, I can handle it. Okay. Or have, have ten. From this, no. This is exclusively for video video editing. So use somebody else's. You didn't bring a laptop. I did bring a laptop. Just do that. It might have no worries. It will work. It's, you I just gotta believe. I've had endless problems. And you were trying to turn it into a on session. Maybe that. With this projector. I didn't care. Did you try to do it last night? I can give it a shot. I'm getting out. Just have to borrow the next person on the list. And it exports as a slides presentation. Slides as a presentation. So how do I hook up then if this is for video editing only? Um, Dylan will show you. So the instructions are. I thought you had a PhD. <laughs> I thought I have a PhD in video systems. So what do you? What's your connector? Do you have an HDMI connector? I do. It's not something I often. Use. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't have an HDMI connector. I don't have an HDMI connector. Yeah. Um, I don't have an HDMI connector. So, so you gotta time me and tell me. Okay, I was gonna give you a three minutes. Oh, okay. well, minute. So it's stand up. And it's 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Okay. Do you have 15 slides, Tim? I don't have slides. You have no slides. I don't have slides. Am I the only one who needs slides? I, I was just like. I, I was like, why not? User customer and. Oh, you have been taking notes already. Yeah. Just you have to you have to have the the market up all the time. You have to well, I think all you really actually have to do is turn on the. You're on that. Okay. You have to turn on the view. Okay. Is somebody write a number in their name? I'm not connected. Yeah. Uh, is there an Ethernet? Is there Ethernet? Yeah. And then yeah. you can do things like this where you have a markdown cell yeah. and, and that markdown will be converted into like a slide. Yeah. Okay. But I, I, can get, I was running into some error and I put my hands up because I'm not really looking at yeah. it. Tim's done a couple times. Oh, you can't connect to the network. I can't connect to the network. Uh, I'm going to in more of a oh, okay. three minute one. Uh, and what is the time? Because I'm oh, okay. a student in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally even forgot about that. <laughs> 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 I have an Ethernet. Live demos? It's too complicated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the next one is Ethernet. Yeah. 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 We're going to unplug the projector. Yeah. No. And you have a do you have a Mac HDMI? Yeah, I have HDMI. Yeah, like, a Mac. Okay. Okay. Is that a crossover? Wow. Yeah. Sorry guys, I'm going to that cool. cool. Okay. I'm sure it is fine. So you, you, just, you can't get on the net? What is your buddy Dan doing? 
Oh no! I haven't talked to him. Oh really? Did he go to grad school? He did. He was kind of like he was doing a PhD with the shaman. Oh really? Yeah. The shaman? Huh? Doesn't seem to. No, I mean, Dan Phillips. Yeah. So you're talking about? No, here. Oh, oh, sorry. What did you say? He was doing astronomy. Oh, astronomy. He said astronomy. I was like, Geneva is like right next to me. No, no. He did astronomy. He was doing astronomy here, and went for the first. He took like a a year break, two year break. Oh, really? Because if you go to the last second, your browser can just forget about you. Because it knows that it's been there before. He always seemed like the mega psychic. Good example. Yeah. 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 I wonder if Max Mission is the right group to do this. From what I understand, it was a mission that's not Tony, did you hear about why everything's going bad at Team Rep? All the data stuff? We should gossip later. <laughs> it's not like bad, bad, just tech bad. That we can't like associate meeting services to events. Oh yeah, I talked to I talked to uh, Eric. Eric about that. Did he show you the cool stuff that he came up with? Uh-huh. He wrote like a lambda function that basically is this SMTP incoming server thing, uh-huh. and then it like does processes with it. Okay. I we we sort of solved it for. Um, a while before Microsoft. They're a little poke in their hole. Thing. Well, so there's like, you can add extended properties to an event. So you can add any key value. It's essentially an open JSON store onto the event. And I don't know if you can do it for Google, but I know that if you remember Dustin, who was around for a bit, yeah. he got it working on Microsoft. Did that work? I did that work. Did you do that? That was my authentication scheme that I wrote for them, using JavaScript web tokens. But that's not the issue we're running into. No, no, and that wasn't the thing that he yeah. saw. He did something else? He did something else. When, 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 he was editing, when he was editing the event, I asked him if he could modify the, it's called extended properties in the event. And the camera stopped working. You all set up first? The camera stopped working for some reason. But other than that, we should be good to go. talk about um, about low rank approximation for sparsely observed data. So um, what's your name? Hi, I'm Tim Anderton. I am an extraordinarily lazy data scientist ninja. Uh, I'm, I'm going to not settle unless I get to be the data scientist ninja. So a perfectly good way to do that is, um, is principal component analysis. And that is basically you want to solve that problem that x is approximately equal to a tall skinny w times a um, short wide h. Um, you want to solve that in the least square sense and you, get, you happen to get principal component analysis. Um, it, and um, 
And you, you can come to this, the thing that is principal component analysis, or what I call principal component analysis, in like dozens of different ways, which is why there are dozens of different names for it. And, um, but so let's, let's do it for um, this data set. It's the, I forget the name, Olivetti faces. There we go, data set. So it's 400 faces of um, just grayscale images. So this is just a color map. Um, it's not flesh tone, um, but um, but it's you know 64 by 64, so it's 4096 pixels. But there's only 400 images, right? But there's still a lot of um, of, of sort of commonality in the structure of all of those faces. I don't want to keep around 4096 columns for um, you know to to encode my data. I just want to keep around enough stuff. Uh, to, to, to be interesting, right? And uh, the, I don't have, if I had uh, millions of faces, maybe I could, you know, justify keeping all 4096. But I can find a perfect representation. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. But I'm going to make it hard on myself because principal component analysis is a great solution to that problem if you have all of each of those faces, right? Um, but I'm going to cut out random blobs out of my out of my images. I'm going to cut totally different random blobs out of each, and that totally destroys my data, right? So I, I or the sort of structure that I could have exploited it before. So so if if I just have um, two columns here, right, and my data looks like this, then I can do a rank one approximation by just taking that, that vector, that becomes my h, and then I take the direction along that, or, you know, so this one, this guy gets, say, call it a value of 1, this guy gets a value of 1.5, this gets a value of negative 0.8, right? And that goes in my w. And then, and then I can multiply that times this vector, I go up and down this way, and I get a nice approximation to my data. I just have to store one number instead of two. But now I'm gonna now I'm going to do the same thing that I did there. I'm gonna randomly kill bits of my data. Right? Okay, well, so now I don't have x for this guy. Or, or sorry, don't have y for this guy. I just have x. And so on, right? And I have no points in the middle at all. But I still want to fit that line. So now in the case of um, in the case of uh, just one dimension, you probably don't you know have a leg to stand on, right? But I've got so much correlation in here of these forty ninety six you know pixels. This pixel's value and this pixel's value are kind of the same thing. I've got I've got such high um, correlation that I have to be able to extract much of the same information. I just destroyed what? Well, actually, I destroyed exactly 20% <laughs> of the information in my data set. So I should be able to get something at least as good or around as good as if I had destroyed, had just removed 20% of my rows, right? Because I, I happened to destroy my data in a responsible way so that I didn't cut out exactly this pixel every time, right? So, so let's try. So, um, so if you try to apply principal component analysis with that data cut out, you get garbage. And you can't even tell that, that what you're looking at is a face. Um, but if you tell PCA, okay, wait, 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 the defin I, can, I, can, I can choose my definition of PCA. And, instead of, and I'm going to say I want least squares. Least squares, the least square solution to that Bill rank approximation is PCA. Okay. Um, the data that is in there has zero weight. Ignore it. It's weighted, weighted least squares. Okay? So you do that, and you actually basically, not exactly, but you get extremely close to the, um, to the same principal components that you would get out of these faces if you had all 400 rows and no occlusion, right? So, so that's fun. Okay, but it's not, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, I don't know, 
it was fun to do. And I, and I wrote this blog post, and I was like, that was fun. That was cool. But, but, um, but I was like, but you know, it sucks that I still have to, I still have to do the computation for 100% of my, of the, of the pixels in my images, even for the ones that aren't giving me any, any information. What if I made things really hard on myself? What if instead of um, just cutting out 20% of my data, I cut out like 90% of my data? Can I still, can I still function? Right? Well, I can get a good approximation to the, a good low rank, say, 20-dimensional approximation to these faces. That means just so long as I destroy less than, it's just so long as I have, you know, 100 or so pixels left in my images, I ought to be able to get some, right? Uh, well, if I had a lot of rows, actually, and I don't have that many rows, but. <laughs> but so, so let's do it for a, a stupid, easy data set, one that is exactly a, a low rank system. So I just say, okay, um, you are some random W times some random H. And here's all of my data. This is my ground truth. It's a low rank system. I happen to know because I've made it. All right, then I kill 90% of everything, right? And it doesn't look the same anymore, but it was extremely redundant to begin with. So what happens if I do regular PCA that doesn't know that those zeros aren't real? I don't, I don't get a good reconstruction, right? It thinks those zeros are informative and I get garbage. Okay, if I do, if I do um, sort of a, a weighting, um, then I can get sort of exactly the right thing. So now, why is this different than what I was just talking about before? Um, so um, it's because this time I didn't do the full calculation. So I'm going to, uh, did I skip it? Uh, <laughs> how many minutes do I have so that I know whether or not to waste time on this? Oh, right. Oh, OK. Huh? Five. Five minutes? So I've talked for 10? OK. I'm, I'm just going to talk my way through it, OK? Because I don't, even if I found the code, it's not going to be any more salient than me just saying it. <laughs> so, so what I did, right, is I said, all right, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to take, um, and I'm going to use, only evaluate my model at exactly the points that I actually have, right? I'm not going to bother with matrix products, say, because Multiplying W by H takes a lot of time. 90% of my data isn't there. So I'm wasting 90% of that computation every time I evaluate my model, right? X is 10 times bigger than my data is. So I should never compute all of X while I'm fitting my model. All I have to do is I just have to take um, up, up uh, the outer product or take W and H multiplied by each other at exactly the points that I um, need, which I, um, which was a function that I passed earlier and didn't talk about, but. Um, Did you do it in Python? The yeah. Python loop? So or? here we go. So um, <laughs> so this may not be clear. That, that's, that, that I'm doing this W times H. But I say, I only care about certain rows and certain columns, those exact pairs, right? Um, and then I just have to go and get the appropriate place in W and the appropriate place in H, multiply them together and sum them together. That's a matrix multiply. I just didn't happen to do it as a matrix multiply because it would be too expensive, right? And then, and then I can, and you say, okay, well, but now I can't use line, any linear algebra practices because, well, I mean, I could use scipy.sparse, but scipy.sparse linalg wants those zeros in your matrices to be really zero, not unknown values, right? So, okay, um, 
why not just do, uh, you know, do break it down into a subproblem that I can solve fast. So if what if it was a rank one, only a rank one system, I can solve that via least squares. I can just write out the equations. I get the right answer, right? I can write down the solution. Well, I have if I have a rank three, if I'm looking for something rank three, I just have the sum of three rank one systems. So I go in, say, here, you have one degree of freedom, find the optimum. <clears throat> Take the residuals, what's left over has to be orthogonal, um, and I can enforce that you know, and keep things pretty, and if you care, then you should read my blog post. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, then, and then I can do, um, and then I can do this cool thing where I can perfectly reconstruct, so, now I have to skip all this code, but I'm going to do the same thing with the, with the faces data set. So now before, you could tell that this is the data that I'm using to do my principal components. Okay? This is a typical example. And, and now you can't even tell, unless, unless you were looking real hard, or were really expert that it was a face there to begin with. Right? Um, and if you do regular PCA on that same data set, if you don't tell it, if you don't mean subtract it for it, then the, then the missing values F up your mean so bad that your principal component reconstruction becomes garbage. But if you tell it what the mean is, um, then, then it basically just gives you back the mean face every time, because everything else gets washed out um, by all those zeros that it thinks it really ought to be reconstructing. But if you... If, but if you do it the sort of the way that I'm going to call it the right way, then you actually can get, um, you know, really pretty good, really pretty good reconstructions or p principal component vectors, even um, even with 90% missing data. So I have one minute left, so I'm just going to say, why is this? Or I mean, I don't know. That's cool, but um, it. But there's tons of other stuff that you can do with this. So um, you can do data imputation, say, um, which I'm not sure is the right way to go about things. It usually would be better to destroy information um, in the same way that you have missing information in your data, systematically destroy that data and train a system on, destroy, on partially destroyed data than it would be to, to do data imputation usually. Or, okay, I don't have enough time, so I'm just going to stop saying or, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you're saying destroy the, destroying the data down to about 10%? Uh, like... Yeah. Did I? I'm, this might be 20% okay. kept. Even but... so, um, and you were talking about training. Wouldn't it make more sense to train your algorithm based on uh, random destruction in, of different elements in the same image? And then putting it back together. Uh, I mean, are you following me, or am I not phrasing it correctly? Well, there was something I badly wanted to say that is along those lines. Okay. So I'm going to say that thing. Um, so something that I'm that's near and dear to my heart, but rarely is the right thing to do, um, is spectral clustering. Um, and so in spectral clustering, you need to build a similarity matrix of all your points to all your other points. And if you have thousand points that's doable and you can do manipulations on that matrix if you have a hundred million points say and you want to deal with a million by million or hundred million by hundred million similarity matrix even if most things aren't similar to each other you're totally doomed right <laughs> um, well not totally doomed but you can't do it the regular dense way right you just cannot but you could exactly. take Sample it, mm -hmm. right? Just go out and get, uh, you know, hundred thousand or um, or ten percent, yeah, ten ten percent, twenty percent of those connections, or one percent, or point oh one percent if you have a really giant matrix, mm -hmm. right? And you can still recover a lot of that same information. And if you do it with, if you just go cherry pick those zeros without, um, and then pretend or sorry, cherry pick those non-zero values and pretend that everything else is zero, you're going to get screwed up by everything you missed that 
that you're saying to your sparse linear algebra is actually zero, it's gonna screw you up. <laughs> but if you use something like this, it's just as fast, but it doesn't assume that all that, uh, that, all that stuff you didn't know is exactly zero, right? Yeah, and that's... But that's still a good way to train it. Definitely. Well, well train your model. so this, another reason that this is fast is because I, um, it's because I can cheat and I can turn the sparse thing into a dense thing that I can do super fast. So if you, you can also do this by gradient descent, say, but it's a lot slower and you don't hit the exact global optimum. Well, this doesn't hit the exact global optimum either, but it's still faster. <laughs> cool. Who's up next? Up next, we have Tyler. That's me. That's the very close up right there. That one. You. Let's see how fantastically this works. I got you on this side. Sweet. Let me go to Miriam. Nope, nope. Still got you on this side and that side. Perfect. Awesome. So, that is some, so, some nice talk. Links. Okay, I'm here. So, hello again. My name is Tyler, I mentioned. I'm working at Control 4, and this is something that I do every day, and so it was, I thought we'd make a, an interesting talk. If, you've, if you're very new to Pandas or Matplotlib or Data Analytics and Python, then this would be really useful. If, uh, for you, Tim, it's probably old news. <laughs> All this kind of stuff. Um, and I'm preparing to talk at Open West, so any feedback is appreciated. And I'm an organi organizer at Open West, so if you want to get involved in doing stuff there, then I'm also want to talk to you. So pandas stand er, is derived from panel data. And what you can do with pandas is you can take a CSV file that is gigabytes long and crunch the numbers and get useful data out of it. So pandas is very useful. Um, what I use it for at work in, uh, in PQA is we'll have like a thousand controllers, out, or not a thousand, a lot more than that, like a hundred thousand servers out in the field. And we want to see if a new hard drive that we put into the chips is, if it's working better or worse than previous hard drive. And so we'll pull all these servers and we'll get tons and tons of data back from them. And with pandas, I can take all of that data from the servers and I can see the disk read speeds, write speeds, uh, uptime of the server, and then I can filter by all that data. I can say I want it to be this specific OS, I want the uptime to be greater than a month, and I can <coughs> see, I can visualize the data in a way that's useful for the company to make decisions like should we buy a cheaper, or is this cheaper hard drive better than a more expensive hard drive. So it's, this really helps us visualize data in a useful way. So you can follow along in a shell, or any in Python shell. Um, when you're looking at matplotlib, pandas, numpy on the online, they'll always import numpy as np and pandas as pd. I don't know why that started being the thing, but that's how it is. So a uh, structure that's fundamental in pandas is this data frame. And you can think of a data frame as um, a table, like you would see in SQL or something like that. Where I have, I've organized it right here where we have rows and columns. And if I run this, look at our data frame. Uh, <laughs> Just created a comment on an empty line. There we go. So, anyway, this is how pandas has interpreted the data frame I just made. We have our indices from 0 to 2, and all of the same data that I put into uh, my arrays up above. And with pandas, you can do all kinds of operations. Like right here, I'm dividing it, the whole frame by itself. So, I end up with a bunch of 1.0s in my table. And if I get rid of that, um, and pandas with matplotlib, it will just magically plot your data 
I don't have to... That took very little settings, like the code for that was just foo.plot, and it turned my arbitrary data into a graph. And there are lots of ways you can use matplotlib to like, make it so you can zoom in on the graph and make different lines, different colors, and all sorts of things. But the great thing about pandas is that it works out of the box without too much configuration. Um, the other great thing about pandas is how versatile it is. So right here I've created a table of arbitrary data. I have Tyler, I have an integer here, a string, and a float. And I've created a table of that data. But if I wanted to change my columns and my indices to be other things, like right here I've made, my columns are all strings. But for my indices, I have one of them as a taco object that I created up here. Another ind index is an integer. And then the taco function itself is an index and then none. So it's very versatile. And you can re-index things later, and if you re-index, it'll keep all the old indices, but it's, Pandas is great if you want to hack up data and try to understand it. So the next thing that's useful here is a lambda function. And I like to consider it the unholy grail of Python. <laughs> because it's so pretty. So here we have a normal function. We're defining a function x, and it's returning x to the power of 2. And we're printing it. And the lambda function, this is the same exact function. I just have my, my parameter x, and I'm returning x to the power of 2. The reason why you would write, want to write a function in that way um, is say if you have if you want to multiply every cell in your frame by if you want to take every cell in your frame to the power of two, you don't want to write a function that just does it to the power just uh, takes a number and puts it to the power of two. It's just kind of wasted space. So you just write a lambda function that says okay I want to or like this one down here, it takes every cell in the frame, every cell yeah in the data frame and turns it into a string and then makes it uppercase. So that's what you'd use the lambda function for in this case. Um, some other things you can do with these lambda functions. Um, you can select based on data. So what I've done right here is I've said, I want to take the bar data frame where the column name, well, you can use an index or a column here. So you don't want to overlap your column and index names. That would be terrible. But I'm grabbing a NumPy series that um, will be my student column only where the name equals Tyler. And so I've selected that row of data from my data frame. And something that is possible to do in Pandas but you should never do is to operate um, in place on a data frame. Every single operation you do in pandas returns in a completely new data frame. You never want to operate on data in place. That's just bad. You'll end up all kinds of problems. Why? So, yeah. Are you sure you're advocating for never using the, say, in place? In it's like um, you, don't want to, you don't want to delete elements from a for loop that you're currently iterating over. But I mean, like, I mean, but I do all the time, like, um, sort place. Yeah, just like this dot sort in place. Equal. Yeah. Okay. And for simple things like that, it it is there. It's possible to do. But I wouldn't like, by default, always do things in place just because you refuse to make a new object. And that would. And it's sometimes do the operations like those apply operations you could do in place across a column. Right, because you're not chopping off any columns or right. anything. And, and, and pandas doesn't work well when you're mutating it. Yeah. And <laughs> something else I've is learned with, uh, mode especially. with pandas is it is not limited by the global interpreter lock. Because most of the code for pandas is written in C and Cython. So pandas can crunch heavy data sets really fast for that. Um, who doesn't know what the global interpreter lock is? I don't know. Okay. 
Global Dot Interpreter Lock, it's what Perl users love to bash Python for. It's, um, Python can only have one interpreter process running at a time. So even if you've threaded your code, it's not really threaded because only one process can use the Python interpreter at a time. And Pandas is able to bypass that by using C. The problem with that is if you have an index, like uh, right here I have an index that's a class, and here an index that's an object, that's my object taco that I created. Um, panda, if you're using multi-threading with pandas, then all of that data just, it, it just doesn't work very well. If you're using multi-threading with pandas, you've got to be using strings, integers, and floats, and that's really all that works. And it's unfortunate. Or you have to transfer all your data to strings, and then multi-thread, analyze it, and then turn it back into your objects. So that's a pain. Run into that a couple times. Um, you can also select in pandas based on an arbitrary criteria. So here I'm saying I'm taking my foo data frame, my foo which had a bunch of, it was a matrix of numbers. And I can say I want foo and I want the first column to be greater than one. And I'm going to grab uh, that data frame. Um, what did foo look like? Uh, okay. So there's foo. And then here's foo where I've chopped off. Oh. Yeah, because this column is not greater than 1. It's equal to 1. And so it chopped off this column, or this row. So you can push a whole bunch of these criteria into a super complex one-liner that'll select your, I want all of my servers that are OS, that's Ubuntu 16.04, uptime of greater than a month, and, <coughs> you and you have a huge long list of criteria for data that you want. So that's useful. Right here, I've done my, uh, I've done my selection on the string inside of the cell contains A. So I've grabbed for my student table everyone that has an A. So that's how that works. Um, and we briefly mentioned it before, we have this lambda function. And what I did here is I have my lambda function takes X and makes and turns it into an uppercase string. So all of my strings are uppercase. You, can, you can use that same dot stir as well to uppercase in particular. Um, you I mean like right here? I think so. I think stir dot upper, if you just, well, you can't use it as a mask then, but if you just take that out, uh, don't put it inside the brackets it needs on the standalone thing. Um, we're talking like this. Yeah, yep. There so we go. That would be a similar way. But apply allows you to have the fun you put anything in apply. Right. <laughs> Absolutely anything. And here in this last cell, oh no. Oh. <laughs> Is it because we've chalked things up? Here we're gonna go back up to where we declared bar. <sighs> Fix it right now. <laughs> Uh, I'm doing, I'm doing. We can just change that stir. This one? Well, what I meant. To oh, do flip the in instance. X is instance no, should be. It's the object and then the type. Is that what it's saying? Oh yeah. Yep. Ah, thank you. <laughs> that was a quick one. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a Python's hacky way of doing a ternary operator. What I'm saying is well, I'm going to have my parameter x. So in this case, I'm doing an apply map, which means I'm operating on every single cell in the data frame. And I'm saying if I'm going to turn that, change the value in the cell to the string number if x is an integer, otherwise 
I'm going to turn it into a string and make it lowercase. Uh, so that case, I've turned all of my grades and my names into lowercase strings. My integers are turned into the word number, and my floats are left alone. So that's an example. Yeah? What? Oh, <laughs> I had a question. Well, do we have any questions then about pandas? If you're going to add in like a requirement to say like getting half-life greater than one or something like that here, would you have to add like another line and then do another object, or would there be a way to add it onto that in the same line? Or? You could probably add it into the same line, but I would, to make things easier to read, I would make it into multiple Multi -line objects. Multiple same line, yeah. Yeah. Yes? Uh, could you digress on um, reading into giant CSV files? Because from my experience, you can only handle something like two gigs, but I guess it might depend on your machine or how you're reading it or something. Uh, I don't know. My computer here has 32 gigs of RAM, and oh, yeah. so <laughs> I, I can handle it. Try to use something that's not CSV. Yeah. Um, and, and if that's all you have, you probably want to try something that would chunk it, so it would read in line by line, yeah. store it out in another file format that's compressed. Yeah. You can use, use H5Pi. Do what? It's something that I do a lot for stuff that's just way too big to be sitting as a CSV somewhere. Using what? H5Pi. So, oh, so yeah. HD, it's a wrapper for HDF5, which is a, a you know, just a hierarchical yeah. yeah, it's hierarchical data format. <coughs> thing. Yeah. And and so it takes a lot less space, and so I can, I I can, and it also doesn't have to all be loaded, and I can still do operations. So I can you can handle much more. Cool. Yeah. 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 Well, I would stick with the chunking the data because if you're going to be hacking it and cutting it up, then take it the biggest chunk you can, hack it, cut it up, select what you need, and then take the next biggest chunk, and eventually you'll have you'll be stuck with just what you need. Yeah. Right. Cool. That's pandas. Let's thank Tyler again. <laughs>
Um, I'm just about to introduce this anyway. But um, what org mode is, it's like, a, it's like a really crazy, sophisticated markup language. It's like take markdown and then add navigation and folding of text and tags, latex output, you import, you can embed images, you can see them in line, so all this stuff is just crazy. And I discovered org mode this summer and it totally changed my life because I always want to take notes, but the context switching for taking notes is really difficult and I never end up taking notes. But now I can my daily notes. In addition to that, every once in a while I'll make documents and I'll, I'll usually start them in org and you know, later they end up in Word because nobody else uses Word. But, um, but it's a nice way to kind of like get some of this stuff done. So, um, so that's org. If that seems interesting, especially if you're an Emacs user, look it up. Org is really incredible. Um, and I, don't like, I, I like all the editors. I'm not like a, a or Emacs is what I use. Um, I, there is no org for anything else, which is one good reason to use Emacs, but don't let me uh, seem like I don't think the other stuff is cool as well. So, um, okay, so what's Babel? So <laughs> inside org, you can actually just run arbitrary code and get the output inside org. So you have a little code block like this. You can say begin source Python, run this thing. Uh, this essentially acts as a function, returns x, and then x evaluates. Um, so um, now let me just, before I get too far along, this entire talk is written with org and with this running document that I have. And um, so there's a bunch of boilerplate. Um, and here's some, I'll, I'll kind of talk about this a little bit later, but here just for some of the things, this startup thing here is called a drawer. So you can like slip it away, open it. Um, these headings all fold. Um, you might have noticed I didn't have a heading in my document called startup because I had this no export tag on the side. So, um, so this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this later, but I had, I'll pull all this data and I, I got the data for this project like off the internet. I cut and pasted out of an HTML table. So it didn't work. <laughs> so I have this obnoxious said script, but I actually run it inside this document. So anyway, it's kind of cool. So now let's just go down to where we're actually doing these talks. We're actually doing the talk that I'm talking about. Um, okay, so here's Babel. And here's just that, you know, here basically is that, uh, that this is the code that generated the same thing as this. So um, anyway, so this is kind of the idea. Um, okay, so now, What's, what's IPython, it'll be IPython, that's the subject of this talk. Um, it's essentially the Babel part which talks to Jupyter kernel. So now you can have a running Jupyter kernel that works with remote kernels, you can do the inline plotting, the whole, you know, the magics work. Um, it, really, it, it really dovetails nicely with org and Babel and all this stuff, so. Um, okay, so that's all I'm gonna talk about, about org. Like I said, org is enormous. You could have a whole like two hour talk just about org. I've actually watched two hour talks. <laughs> but, um, so now I'm going to show you how cool it is by doing an analysis. And, um, and, and like I said, each of these slides is generated with LaTeX. So it's actually like, I'm not advocating for this as a way to make talks because I think it looks kind of ugly, but it is cool that you can like kind of write code and um, generate documentation at the same time. So um, what's the idea? Um, the premise of this analysis I'm going to do this is a total toy, so don't like take this serious at all. But everybody loves uh, um, Bitcoin, and everybody loves Kalman filters. So I came up with like some Bitcoin Kalman filter analysis. Um, but if you're not like a kind of stock geek, I mean, I'm not a very good one. But there's a there's a uh, security called GBTC, which is essentially it's a Bitcoin trust. So they hold Bitcoin. Uh, one share is worth like a tenth of a Bitcoin, not exactly, but approximately. Um, and so it, of course it. It, it's proportional, its value is proportional to Bitcoin, but it's its own share, it's its own security. So it, can, you can, it has different liquidity properties, so you can get into it and out of it perhaps easier. It's only traded on the weekdays. So its price does not, it's not exactly one-tenth. So this, this plot here is uh, GBTC, uh, oh, whoops, that's wrong. GBTC times 10 and Bitcoin. And, um, and you can see there's these kind of, there's these dips. Now you would expect a trust to trade a little bit more expensive than the actual product <coughs> itself. Because there's some, they actually own computers that have the Bitcoin and all that stuff. So there's some overhead. But obviously that's not like constant. So there's, there's some stuff going on here. And um, what I think what happens with this security is that it's, it's, it tends to be more volatile. It almost trades like at a beta to uh, Bitcoin and that you can get out of it fast. Um, so I think it tends to kind of ride harder. But you, could, you could, might think to yourself, that, well, when, when uh, GBTC drops low, that works. So um, maybe let's, let's like find this code block and like kind of just run it to see how this works. Um, 
So here's this figure, here's the code that produces it. Um, like I said, I, these are all Panda data frames as well. I do the, all the stuff that happens, it just happens a little higher, paying attention to the code. BTC is the Bitcoin. Uh, at this point, they're actually just Panda series. Um, and then GBTC is gonna be the, uh, um, the, the other security. So uh, if I, you know, Emacs is all magic keystroke, so control C, control C executes this. Um, and then I just regenerate the figure. Of course, I already generated everything just like one minute ago, so I don't have to be too live. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so but it's really nice. So you can, you know, so when if I'm doing a project work, I'll oftentimes have, you know, text about here's a figure, here's some analysis to do, and then I'll write a little code in a block like this, execute it, and I'll kind of have running notes. So um, you can also just embed figures. You don't have to actually generate the code or anything like that. But, uh, okay, so let's go down more. Um, the next slide. Um, so let's try to fit this with uh, least square. That's the most obvious. Um, all this uh, results of the fit. I just print them out into my notes. Um, none of this I export. I just export this slide here with the figure. So it's funny. It has this weird background. Okay, now it's fixed. Okay, so here's here's this. So um, so of course it's linear. I mean the whole idea of this security is linear, but this isn't something we can trade on. It seems that it stays really high, then it goes low. I mean, we're getting the average, but what we really want are these kind of more subtle uh, aspects. So, um, so what can we do? Um, well, we can apply a Kalman filter. Um, I didn't come up with this at the back end of this talk I have where I essentially stole this analysis. They use it for a pairwise trading. Like it, it's like a, Essentially, you have two stocks that um, move together. You, when, they, when they tend to fluctuate together with one fluctuates away from the other, then you expect them to regress back to the mean. So you, try, you buy. Um, anyway, you can read the analysis later. It's actually a pretty cool talk, um, but um, it's at the bottom of this talk if you're interested. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna take this linear system and sort of morph it into a Kalman filter. The, the fit parameters in, so this is y equals mx plus b, m and b are become the Kalman state. Now I get one of those per time slice. Um, this matrix, this becomes, this is our A matrix, so there's a relationship there. So this would be like the uh, transition statement of the Kalman filter, and this would be the observation statement. Um, and so here I just multiply, and so here it's obviously just the mx plus b. Uh, so z, the observation in this case, is our uh, GBTC. So out of this, it's kind of a weird way to use a Kalman filter. Um, so that our filter, we're going to filter essentially M and B. Um, now, so I have the, these noise parameters are actually really important. In this case, um, I just pick some constants. Actually, it's even worse than that. I tuned the constants to get enough noise, the sort of right amount of noise, so I could trade on it. Um, <laughs> you'll see later that it doesn't even really work that well, but um, it's kind of for fun. We could do, you, one could do better. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so here's um, just one more statement about this. I've already explained it. Um, okay, so we run the Kalman filter. Let's see. It's using the PyCalman package. If any of you guys have played this up a little bit, um, uh, it actually is a really cool package. It makes doing Kalman filters super trivial. Um, and then I just run it. I can run it again, and you'll see my figure pops up. Um, so you can see it kind of settles for a bit, and then it kind of seems like it's sort of constant. At least, I mean, it's dominated by this scaling, so it's kind of weird. So you can't really see the features. Something weird is obviously happening out here. Um, okay, so let's go on. Okay, so how does, does this thing work? Um, essentially, what I'm going to trade on in this this thing is these residuals. So I define the residuals as the um, the uncertainty in this calculation, you know, you know, this statement above is basically how well does this thing do. The, <laughs> the uncertainty calculation, I'm just not showing. I have it, it's in, you guys can see it here if you want, but I just kind of gonna skip it. Um, and, but you can see that there's obviously different paradigms here. It seems like it's behaving pretty normally, kind of on the left side, and over here it's sort of not working. Uh, or at least my, my, my sigma has no, makes no, no meaning here. So um, we go down. Um, now I'm just gonna show the left-hand side. Okay, so this thing sort of is behaving like 
kind of expected. It's kind of within a sigma. Um, and, um, and, you know, the stock is kind of going out. Um, obviously, it's just going like crazy, right? Because it's Bitcoin. And so now you sort of see the problem, right? Like the scale changes so much. So obviously the noise, because they use a constant noise, um, there are obviously like different levels of noise. So these R and Q should have been kind of maybe, you can make them scale with Bitcoin or something. I mean, maybe there's things one could do. I didn't do them. Um, and then let's just kind of, because I'm, the whole idea of this is to kind of show us how some of this stuff works. Um, you'll see here, you can see, this is actually the calculation of the, uh, uh, what I use for the Sigma calculation, but you can just embed LaTeX in org documents natively and it just works. Um, so that's pretty cool. At least if you like LaTeX, not everybody really does. Um, so, yeah, so I guess we're just, so here's kind of the stuff we've just gone through. This is the before, this here is the before part. And this is just how I generated that plot. Yeah, you can obviously see there's some commented code out because I was playing with these things like not too, not even like that long ago. So anyway, um, so now, um, Let's just try to do, I wanted to do a simulation. So I guess kind of what I wanted to show is you can, it's easy to embed actual source code um, uh, into these, if you generate documentation out of this. So, so that's kind of a cool aspect. So if you get this spike, that's kind of what we're looking for. We were, like, we're hoping that GBTC starts to really plummet and then we buy some and then once it kind of stabilizes, we get out of it. I guess that's the kind of, was the hope of this sort of idea. Sort of seems to work. I don't know what's going on over here. Um, so, so let's just kind of go down to the org document a little more. Um, here's my little simulation. I can just rerun it. Um, and then if I go down a little farther, so this is actually the slide I turned into that slide. And then um, plot this figure of it. And, um, and that becomes this, this slide here. And so here's kind of our entry points and exit points. I meant to mark uh, those, but I kind of forgot. Yellow is we're getting out, we're selling. Blue is we're buying. This is kind of our net worth. Um, you know, obviously it's just noise. Um, but I mean, we got, we, we left with one share, so we were up. But uh, I mean, <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, okay, so that's a toy. Uh, like I said, I, I literally copied another analysis and tried to play, apply it to this. It didn't work great, but um, it was still kind of interesting. So, what I'm trying to sort of make a case for OBI Python, I, I mean, I, I know a lot of people like Python notebooks and I've used them. I think that they, they were super cool. We already saw two of them tonight. But, um, so for me, it's really hard to write code in a web browser. And those are the two things that kill me for Python notebooks. And, um, and the second thing is it just doesn't work well with source control, at least for me. Uh, maybe you guys have tricks. But, um, but, but anyway, but, so if you using Word documents, you kind of get a lot of those strengths with list functions. I don't think there are any like, that are come stock. But I mean, I don't know. One, I'm sure obviously people can write anything in Lisp. But um, you know, there's lots of weird boilerplate. So uh, LaTeX. You know. Yeah, I'm the only person in my company that has any interest in it. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, you know, kind of how it is. Um, anyway, that, that's basically all the material. Um, if you are interested in any of this stuff, um, I'm going to put this on GitHub, just a single page, and one, like, like requirements.txt file, if you want to, like, include all the projects, the Python libraries I use for this. But, um, so here's some stuff on org. This, right here, this YouTube talk is by the guy who wrote org. He was, like, a... Uh, German astrophysicist with way too much time in his hands. And um, it's a good talk. <laughs> so I, uh, I highly recommend that. And uh, here's just the basic Babel documentation. If you're going to use OBI Python, that's the only information that's out there. I use a lot of Beamer. This is actually the first time I've ever used Beamer. It's, it's <laughs> hilarious. And then if you are only interested in this in terms of the uh, analysis I did, if you go to this website, you'll see like all the same figures. I mean, I totally stole it. So uh, that's, that's that. So. Anyway, that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions? I don't know. I, oh yeah, yeah. So that boilerplate, are you copying and pasting that for each cell? Um, so, yeah, it's too late. So there, you saw like this whole long line, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so but of course there's snippets. 
Okay. So you, I, I literally would type P Y tab, and then it, it drops that whole thing out. And then, then there's like three fields that so I you control X J Q M, and then <laughs> <laughs> fair, it's fair. But no. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I would type. I should do. I should have done. That. I would type P Y tab, and then there's like three other fields, and you can like tab through and sort of fill them out. So it makes that kind of easy. But yeah, it's it's not as nice as like just like. That. It's one of the weaknesses. And then if you saw the top of that document, there's like 200 parameters that did. And none of that's really needed. That was just for the Beamer export. And that will also be generated automatically for you if you would like as well. But, um, but yeah, those lines are like, <laughs> I, I can tell you what everything means in that line too. It's just a little hilarious. <laughs> but uh, that's, <laughs> that's some of the weaknesses. Right? So, cool. Any more? More talks, Dylan? Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank Oh, yeah, Dylan's talking. Okay. Let's go. Come on. Heaps of death. Okay, so my presentation is on processing on heaps of data. Um, my name is Dylan Gregerson. Um, I have a cat, I like boating, I like skiing, I like vegan food. And I'm also the lead data scientist at Team, where Ferris also works. Gross. <laughs> and um, our like, mission goal in, in the world is to improve the workplace experience. What does that mean? Um, so one of the primary ways that we help is we help schedule uh, conference rooms. So like this room has somebody who schedules it. Um, <laughs> and there's a whole person who has a spreadsheet that says, oh, this person has it on this day. Well, what we do is we turn that into a tool, a software tool that Ferris helps maintain. And um, that tool allows everybody in an organization to uh, collaboratively book a space and creates an independent person that says, this is who has it. Um, what that means for my team is that we have a stream of event data. So we have events that happen inside of conference rooms and then we're analyzing that event and providing insights so we can tell somebody such as like how often is a particular meeting space used? Could you deprecate a space and use it for other purposes? We allocate it. Um, it's kind of hard. Oh, it's way hard. It's kind of blurry. Uh, this would be like an example of some event data. Uh, we have an ID, a uh, title. Um, start and end time, there's attendees, including Ferris and me. <laughs> I didn't accept that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, sort of the, when I first started building the pipeline to get the data, um, this was about three years ago, we were trying to think about how do you do this for millions of events, um, tens of millions, billions of events across thousands of rooms, so how are we going to uh, process all of this data? So this is a kind of common problem in big data. You have a heap of files, either they're stored like on something like S3, or you might have a big queue or an actual stream with something like a, a queuing system that goes in. And then you want to process all that event and store your results. And so in this case, um, I'm describing, well, I'm describing here, I'm pointing out that what the, the goal that we're getting to is that you're going to have a process that's going to work on each of these events. Um, the event data in, in this particular use case is independent data, so like my event, one event does not depend on the other, so I should be able to process them independently. So the point of this talk. The point of this talk is that I recently revisited all my code that I wrote a while ago, um, and that has worked well up to this point. Um, and that how do, what's the, what are the next steps for scaling it out um, over more and more data? Um, some of the main takeaways I think are important are these, that Python is good for multiprocessing. You can scale to help as your data scales if you scale horizontally as well as uh, vertically within a machine across more cores. Um, and then I have a little discussion at the end about best practices for implementing multiprocessing. Okay, so adding parallelization. So in this little uh, 
toy description diagram. We have uh, all of our event data. And actually, ideally, we wouldn't have parallelization. We would just have really, really, really fast CPUs because that gets rid of a lot of complexity. When you don't have to, to split up your processes and allocate memory, your job becomes much simpler to just like chug through all of your data. Now, the problem that we've come to is that CPUs are not getting faster fast enough. In fact, they got slower. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, the solution that the whole world is turning to is multi-core. And the very next step, and so like the first multi-core came mid-2000s that became available in all of our computers. Pretty much any computer that we have here is going to have multiple cores. Our phones do, our watches do, our glasses do. <laughs> You've got Google Glasses, multi-core. Um, and then when you're processing data like this, you often end up into multi-node as well, more than one machine, not just more than one core. And each one of those steps adds complexity. So um, when you go to Bobby multi-core, you have to have something that handles those processes and make sure they're not fighting for the same uh, resources. Same thing as when you go to multiple machines. You got to make sure that they're not fighting for multiple resources as well as what happens for failures and handling that sort of stuff. So you're adding lots of complexity to each of these steps. So uh, multiprocessing, what do I got? I have some data and I essentially want to apply a function to it. I'm doing a, a map sort of function. Um, it's a little hard to read here, the top, but the top is the uh, function that I'd be uh, passing. So it takes some event data. It would read that in, modify it, save the output. Um, my event may look like uh, this is my collection of data, which I'm sort of describing here as S3 files. You have a particular event file, and you'd read it in and process it. And then um, here would be the very bottom here is that uh, non-parallelized. I go through, and for every event in my event stream or my event bucket, my heap of data, I run this function on it. Um, so, so my pro tip is to actually write it functionally, to write it where you have um, this coming in. You can do lots of things where you might wrap your data into a class and do stuff. Don't do that. <laughs> write a function that would then process it. So that would be sort of your first step if you were approaching something where you have a heap of data and you want to process or do some sort of map or reduce function, reduce process, write it as a function. So here's um, just an extension of that. So the first part of this is the same code. Um, and what I wanted with this slide is to essentially talk about uh, mapping. So mapping is when you take uh, some inputs, you run through a function, you get an output. And you just do that across your whole input data set. Um, so uh, these two bits of code are equivalent. Um, down here, I'm using this partial, um, which is a, a way to add in this parameter into my function. And then I'm using Python's map function to call my new event and call it with every event to my stream and get the result. So um, the idea behind this, uh, this sort of map process, you have your heap of data, you have your function, and you're just plugging your heap through the function. Um, some tips for the next step is that your function um, should not share memory. So you wouldn't have global variables shared across your function. Try to keep it contained. When you're multiprocessing, you're going to write that function out and take all of the data that's associated and put that all together so that it runs entirely independent of anything else, of all of your other processes. Which means if you have large data going into your function, whatever process is going to actually consume that data. So if you have a two gigabyte CSV file <laughs> and you run that and that's one of your constants across a function, you're going to have that multiplied in each location. Because processes bundle together, when you're multiprocessing, bundle together your data and your function to go run somewhere. So here's uh, Python into uh, multi-core. So you see that I, I just compressed my little data uh, description, my same function. I'm using the same partial description. And then instead of Python's map, I'm using uh, multiprocessing pool map. So the idea here is that you're creating, uh, Python creates a pool of processes across your cores. And so it uh, 
spins those up. They're essentially Python interpreters, their own independent interpreter with their own independent gil. Um, and then your function and the data get piped out to it. It allocates the memory for it. There's a bit of overhead. And then it runs your function. But then you're thread safe. Yes. But then you're thread safe. Um, so here it is again. Uh, so if we just flip back and forth. Um, some the additions that I added here. So uh, how many uh, a few notes that I want to make. So how many people are familiar with contexts, with contexts, not without contexts? Okay, they're a useful uh, construct. Um, here I'm. Oh, I didn't add the processes in. But here I'm. I'm using the processes, so I'm passing that as a parameter. Another useful thing is the chunk size, because you're passing out the data to your process. Um, you have some overhead in serializing that and then spinning it up and running the process. So this chunk size can help control, like, run five elements, or in this case, ten of my whole list in this one process for each, each of my cores. So that, that will run in serial, but it will be in its own process. Um, my other pro tip here is that it's much if you're using a serialized than if you're using multiprocessing. Even with one processor, it puts in all that overhead. So having this sort of logic that splits it out, and when you're developing, running it with one process, and then when you're ready to switch over, test it with multiple. I actually learned just I learned about this just recently. Uh, Joblib is just a wrapper around the multiprocessing default um, that adds this sort of stuff. So it adds uh, some extra transparency. It adds a parallelization helper, which is uh, this dot parallel that, that gets run, um, that does a lot of these uh, the chunking, as well as uh, if you set number of jobs to one, it actually runs it in series. So you don't, I don't need that if statement anymore. And it adds some extra help with logging. Um, and add some extra compression. So when you send your function and your data, your data is, is compressed a little bit faster. Um, this is the syntax. Um, I'm using a decorator. They have a delay decorator on your function. And then I can call my processes just like I can call my inputs, uh, just like I would um, calling the function. And then this is a list comprehension, because I think it's pretty that, prettier that way. Yep. Yeah, you're right. Instead of deplay, it should be delay. Okay. Don't worry, I'll end up fixing his code. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, that's sort of where um, where I've ended up with a single node. So. Um, it's these first two for a single node. As soon as you start going to multi-node, there's actually um, IPython has its own uh, tool that will allow you to spin up um, multiple, spin up your process on multiple computers and use the cores on those computers. And then you start to get into um, bigger scale uh, products like Kafka, which is its own project in and of itself with a wrapper for Python. And Kafka helps take your Python code and your um, data and distribute that out for you, and then collect it back up. And a lot of these abstractions uh, hide all that complexity that I talked about earlier from going from a, so multi-processing, which I just showed, helps hide the complexity of putting your process onto multiple um, cores. These help hide your pro help hide all the complexity of putting it out onto multiple machines. And these also will help uh, for fail-safe if a machine goes down. Um, how to handle what do you do with that data if something's not processed. And so all those things start to get bundled up, but the same concept actually applies. You have a heap of data, you have your function that you want to run, and then you just use one of these tools to do a map uh, type function on your data. So I, I uh, learned a lot, I took a lot of the, some of the ideas I put into here from this, uh, from Andrew Montalenti's talk. <coughs> Um, 
he works at Parsley where they're doing a lot of this uh, processing where they're essentially mapping and processing URLs and they have a function and you have all your data and they're using these same sort of tools to scale uh, Python out to thousands and thousands, literally thousands of cores. So some of my pro tips and best practices that I've kind of put together from this. Uh, use, for, use simple functions and make sure that all of your inputs are serializable. So no open sockets, no um, open files, things like that. Uh, you'll, get sh you'll get shut down hard for it and that'll be a source of pain with uh, errors, but that's how you should think about coding these. You want to avoid share state. So your processes should not know about the, the memory or share um, memory functions with other memory objects with other processes. Um, adding logging should be done to each process separately and then joined together later. The uh, run in a single process for debugging and then think, be a little bit aware when, when you're writing these processes out, that memory is going to um, grow and so that's sort of one of the downsides. You get to use lots of machines at the same time but you're using a lot more of those memory allocations because you can't store the same thing in memory for both times. That's, so that's the end of my talk um, but I did want to like so if anyone wants to talk about that more. Talk about if anyone had any extra comments for tips. I ran into, I was uh, trying to speed up a program that I have that is basically going off and pulling JSON objects off a web server. And I was doing it serially, and it was obviously taking forever. So, right. And I ran across a slide in a presentation that had the map and pool, and I'm, you know, the literal yeah. head exploding. Um, but for some reason, whatever, using the, the multiprocessing module and using Pickle, I think, to do the serialization, mm -hmm. it was barfing on some of the aspects of the, the program that I was using. And people knew about it on, on uh, mm -hmm. um, Whatever. And they suggested using multiprocess, which uses DIL to do the serialization instead, and that solved all my problems. And it was able, I was getting like a three, three times speed up mm -hmm. doing that. So I just think it's amazing. I, I, it's yeah. Still, it's still, still magic to me, but it's really, I was amazed. amazed. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah, uh, how do you know when it's done? Um, so, well, so what, what happens with uh, something like this map? Okay. Um, it has some, you have some definitive list mm -hmm. of your Well, that's why I mean, the bit list is very big. Right. You've got two alternatives here. Right. Mm -hmm. You can either look at the data that's coming out of the back end that you're storing in your pool, mm -hmm. your output pool, and you can start processing on it before it finishes, or you explicitly have to wait for it to finish and run a QA step to make sure you've got everything. Mm -hmm. So my question is, can you do the both alternatives? Um, so in this in this particular case, uh, you might you would probably take some sort of batch mm -hmm. and run that batch and and you know it's done because it actually this map is blocking. Okay. So while you gave it a full list, it'll run that in parallel, but this whole step will block okay. until you're done. And so then you would know it's done with a batch. Um, if you had something more like a stream. You wouldn't want to use a batch like this. You'd have some sort of queue where to pull something off the queue, and your function would also delete it off the queue. And there are um, some of those, like the Pi Kafka, will handle that deleting the data. Like my my function ended successfully. It didn't raise an error, so I assume everything's right, and I'm just going to throw the data off my queue. Perfect. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of looking into multiprocessing and uh, threading Python module to kind of like get a speed boost for Ray's program. Did you also run into that type of, um, or did you kind of explore both of those libraries in deciding like how to proceed and which one would be better or which one like fits your use case a little bit better? Um, yes, uh, I, I have a little bit. Um, one of the tricks when you're looking between multiprocessing and multi-threading um, is that one of, one of the big things is that threads threads share memory, but Python is bad with threads because of the gil. Yeah. So when you have two process, the way that and the gil is amazing. The gil has lots of benefits to it, 
Um, and and that, but it doesn't want you for having shared memory to fight for that memory. And so it has a particular lock, one thread runs, releases the lock, or gets forced to, and then another process can run. So multi-threading won't necessarily give you a speed boost in that sense. Multi-threading is better, threading is better for IO bound operations. Mm -hmm. So if you're writing a WebSocket, if you're waiting for network traffic, if you're writing out a large file, you might do that um, with a thread where you say, okay, here's my thread, I start it up, write a big file out to the system. While the system is actually writing that file, the thread says, I don't need the CPU anymore. And so it explicitly releases that, so another thread can run. But um, for processes, if you're trying to do a big computation, you're probably CPU bound. So the processor itself is your limit. You're not waiting for a socket, you're waiting for input, you're not waiting for something. You're actually just running as fast as your CPU can go. And for that scenario, you want to use processes. And maybe that answers your question. Yeah. Cool. Yeah? Well, what is the advantage of using the pool and giving the basically the file is what I'm understanding it correctly to all of the various nodes. Even if you're doing a batch, um, you could use a queue and, and basically push it out to all the various ones, if that makes sense, and then, then it all gets done in a particular order. Like, what, what would the advantage of using the pool over that, over queue be for, for batch objects? Um, So the, the pool helps handle some of the, the spinning up and joining of, of processes. Oh, okay. So some of that you don't have to handle explicitly then. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I believe you can still use a pool and a queue simultaneously. Oh, okay. So you create a, a queue uh, thread or a queue process that's out there holding stuff. And then you have your pool of workers. Mm -hmm. And you have maybe some leader that's pulling things off and throwing them out to, their, out to the different uh, Oh, so that's how process. It, that's cool. it's a, to sort of bounce off this question, that's how it was, it's done. There is like a master thing that says like, all right, I'm, I'm finished now. I don't need to keep doing yeah. that. Because in my mind, I'm like, well, wouldn't you just do the whole thing and all the cores just duplicate it? <laughs> yeah, that, that's where a lot, of the, a lot of the architectures you have a particular uh, either leader node or um, something, something that's managing that for you, a scheduler. Um, and so like most of the, so, sometimes you can have it on the same machine, even, depending on your service you're running. Yeah. Um, oftentimes when you get big enough, you say, okay, this server, this is my leader, and it manages what to run, and, and then it says, okay, now there's just uh, n number of workers. And it just throws that out there, throws it out there. If this machine dies, which happens when you're starting your lots and lots of machines. Yeah. It says, "Oh, hey, like I gave it this. I gave it entry 100 to 552, uh -huh. and and it says, okay, this died. So ignore that. Now take that chunk and give it to this new one, or give it to one that's still existing. Oh, that's cool. and that's built into the to the the pool." Processing. So not for, not for multi-processing, because remember that, what I'm doing is still one node, one, okay. one core. But the packages like Kafka mm -hmm. um, or Amazon's Firehose, mm -hmm. Firehose does it under the hood. Yeah. It's, it's doing this sort of management for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, so that code you just showed us, though, so that, that, that pool doesn't do that. That's, that would essentially be the same thing as under the hood, basically, as, as having a queue and doing the put. And, then having the worker notes get it, it just is, is taken care of, or am I misunderstanding that? Um, so for the multi-processing, it actually spins up an entirely new Python instance, and there's no shared memory at all. Yeah. And so they don't have to share the, the global interpreter. Well, it's, I, I just did a thing where I was taking WebSocket data, which makes sense to have a queue, and I have right. a bunch right. of different processes. I was wondering if there was any advantage to doing, because that's I did a I did a batch process, and I just basically copied the same code. <laughs> and now I'm thinking like, oh, well, that probably wasn't the best way to do that. <laughs> but I don't, I don't, I'm not seeing necessarily why. Yeah. If, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can uh, continue after we're yeah, sure. at nine o'clock. So <laughs> let's wrap it up. Okay. Um, 
So it, in the past, we had a lot of medical image processing. And okay. if you need a, a step where you need to scale to multi-core, but you suddenly, suddenly find yourself also needing to scale that across multi-node, um, you can combine multi-processing with celery workers and celery tasks. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to effectively target multi-nodes and then combine it back into a, a master worker data set. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a little bit more control than Kafka and other um, uh, systems that handle it, basically handle the hook for you. So I, I just throw that out there. If you find okay. yourself in needing to scale, consider um, splitting your data mm -hmm. manually um, and in, in semi-large batches. And then once you arrive at a worker node, then you can pull down the data across multiple nodes using multi-processing. So you're putting celery into this this sort of category. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sweet. Thank you, Dylan. <laughs> so I'm saving all the good prizes for February. Like finding some. You talked about a total on that. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a wizard on. There's only one though. So there's going to be this book amongst other things at the February soiree. Okay. Yes, raffling. So this is our uh, our raffle prize for the day. While I'm pulling this, uh, oh, I guess my terminal disappeared. This is going to be tricky. I get to code without being able to look at my code. Come on. Can everybody see that? Okay, cool. I can't, so. Um, a note about why I like to raffle off books. My first meetup I ever attended as a wee lad um, when I was a student here um, over 10 years ago was the Linux user group, which always had the coolest name because it was Slug. <laughs> um, the Salt Lake Linux user group. And they were in the engineering building and somebody did talk about Ruby on Rails and they had a little book about Ruby on Rails and how to code your own Ruby on Rails website. And somebody else won the raffle. And I was like, that's cool. Can I look at the book? And the guy's like, just have it. I use PHP. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so then I started coding it. And I got about halfway through the book. And I was like, why does this not handle numbers correctly? Oh, because it's Ruby. Um, so, yeah, I switched over to Django just as Django had come out, and the rest is kind of history. So, Django, Linux, and so, yes, here is a Python book. It could be yours. It could be the one that you throw to some other person, and that person throws it away and switches back to Ruby. So, <laughs> there we go. Intro to machine learning with Python. Now, to make sure this works, does everybody have a number on their name tag? If you don't, raise your hand real quick. I never got you never got a name tag? Okay, just raise your hand if you don't have a name tag with a number on it. Okay, who, who, do you know where we got to with the numbers? I think they're on the side. Oh. So, sorry, what number was it? Do we have 20? 21. Check your tag. 21? Anybody higher than 20? All right, so you're 21. If he, does he not have a number? Oh, he's missing a number? OK. You're missing a number? 23? I think mine was 6, but it's only got a little squiggly line. Yeah. You're 24 then, now. <laughs> and we're going to pair program a little bit, people. So number of Pythonistas equals what did we get to? 20? So what you said, 24? 24. So 24 plus 1, because I'm 0. And we're going to import random. And then we're going to random dot rand int. Let's see, 0 num python easter. Ah. There we go. Ba -da -da -da. Come on, so hit enter. You want to hit enter? Loop. 22. Woo! Just 22. Yeah, you yeah. All right. So. <laughs> One of the 22s. There you go. And yeah, that's it for talks for the next two months. 
Um, the next one, of course, is the soiree on the 7th. If you haven't signed up on Meetup, sign up on Meetup. That'll be my main one that I'm checking. But also sign up on Eventbrite. It is linked on the Meetup. Um, hope to see you all there. It is a bunch of fun. Oh, and that one, I encourage people to bring uh, friends, to bring family with them. It's very family friendly, very date friendly. It's a fun time. And there will be lots of prizes. So the more people you bring, the more potential you have to steal the prize from that plus 